All right, folks, I think we are good to go. If you haven't already done so, uh, please go ahead and check your audio, and thanks for joining us today. And if you are having any audio trouble, um, you can always call in by phone, and the number's in the chat. And if you've just barely joined us, you might not be seeing that, so I'll put that in again. There you go. So I'd like to welcome you to the fourth webinar of the 2017 IGNIS season. And we're just so happy to have you join us today. Uh, for those that may not know or haven't attended a webinar before, IGNIS is the Latin word for spark or ignite, and that's exactly what we're hoping to do today, to ignite your curiosity and to spark your intellect. This series is brought to you by the Office of E-Learning and Open Education at the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. And your hosts today are myself, Alyssa Sells, and um, my partner in crime, Mark Carbon. And we'll go ahead and share our contact information with you at the end of the webinar. Our presenters today are Alyssa Jones and Bill Hartman. And our topic is a CISS DSS perspective on achieving campus accessibility through collaboration. So a big thank you to Alyssa and Bill for sharing their knowledge and expertise with us this afternoon. I did insert a slide here that we don't normally have. Um, hashtag uh, GAAD, that is for Global Accessibility Awareness Day. So happy Global Accessibility Awareness Day to everyone. And if you would like to uh, learn a little bit more about that, I've got a link for you. You can go check it out around the world today. There's lots and lots of um, accessibility webinars and activities and all sorts of things going on, so you can go read more about that if you'd like. Our captions are provided by ACS Captioning, and um, we thank them for being with us today. All of our webinars are captioned, so um, you can view those captions if you need them by clicking on the CC button in the upper left panel of your screen. And um, you can also, if you prefer to use your keyboard, you can use Control or Command F8 to open, and Control or Command plus W to close that captioning window. And then you can also find a list of Collaborate keyboard shortcuts uh, located in the Help menu, or you can also access those online. And I'm going to give you the link um, straight to those there. That's in the chat also. And then should you need it, um, I've also got a link to the Collaborate Accessibility Guide. So just a couple of um, links for you there. As a reminder, this webinar is recorded. And there's our lovely presenters there, Alyssa and Bill. And uh, Mark will be introducing them in just a second. So um, let's see, I lost my spot. Um, I forgot to show you the slide for the um, where you can find the shortcuts, but I did I did give you the link. Okay, so to find the recording, you can go to the ATL blog, and um, there's a whole tab there dedicated to Ignis. There's a whole little menu tab there. Uh, link is in the chat for that as well. So after the webinar today, if you'd like to go back and re-listen or share it with someone, um, we'll get those posted within a few days of the webinar. Usually might have it posted by tomorrow, but definitely by Monday. You can find all of the recordings from all of our webinars um, there uh, for all of our years that we've been doing this. So uh, I encourage you to check that out. And then uh, traditionally, we start our IGNIS webinars by running through a few of the Collaborate tools. And we're going to go ahead and do that now. And then I'm going to turn it over to Mark, who will introduce Alyssa and Bill. And then um, I'm going to go through these slides a little quickly, um, just because the only features we're going to use today are going to be um, the chat and polling. So um, let's take a peek here. This is your meeting interface, the whiteboards where you're seeing the slides now. There is a small toolbar in the middle there with whiteboard tools. I don't believe we're going to be using any of those today. Um, upper left shows you uh, the audio video. That's where my picture is right now. And then the middle section is a participant panel, and you can scroll through that and um, see who all is in attendance today. And um, at the bottom left corner of um, 
the interface is our chat window, and um, you can feel free to type your comments and questions into the chat as we go, or you can raise your hand to ask a question. We'll show you how to do that in just a second. And since we're on the topic of the chat, I do see that Jerry Lewis from um, CBC is asking me a question already, and he wants to know if we're going to export our recordings and repost them outside of Collaborate. And yes, we are. We've already got all of them exported and saved, we just need to upload them to YouTube and generate some new links, and um, those will be repo reposted um, with links that you can view from um, near the end of June when our contract ends with Collaborate. So yes, we definitely do plan to do that. All right, here are a few tools, and um, you can see there's emoticons if you want to give a little happy face. I'm going to go ahead and do that now so you can see what that looks like. If you need to step away, you can click your away button. You can raise your hand to ask a question, and that will put you in the queue. We'll know which order to call on you. And then the fourth one over um, where it says polling and it shows a check mark, actually if you look at your participant panel and find that, it's set to a small case A right now, and that's because the poll that we're going to start off with is an A through E answer. So um, if you want to take just one second and practice, um, if you hover over uh, that A, you can select from the letters that are there. If you want to give a practice, I just did that just so you can see where those are. We're going to be starting off with a poll here in just a little bit, so make sure you know where that button is. All right, I'm going to go ahead and clear those results. Um, one little reminder that if your talk button is turned on, we can hear you. So if you're not currently raising your hand and asking a question and speaking, we ask that you do keep those turned off, just so we don't get any background noise. And that is the end of my introduction. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mark, and he's going to introduce our presenters to you. Take it away, Mark. Well, thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, spending some time with us this afternoon and uh, listening to some great information here by Alyssa and Bill. So Alyssa is uh, currently has a bachelor's degree in interdisciplinary um, and is, oh, sorry, I'm trying to read here at the same time. Let me get my page fully, fully open for you. Um, and it's just if technology applications uh, certificate as well, and she's going to be pursuing her master's degree here in the new future. Uh, she, Alyssa has a variety of experience in higher education, as well as a background in social justice and activism. And Alyssa is also passionate about working with students, faculty, and staff to facilitate access and success with an equitable campus culture. Um, and Bill is the, currently the IT Help Desk Coordinator an IT Accessibility Specialist at Billingham Technical College. Bill has over 25 years experience and has worked in a variety of information technology and customer service related positions, uh, both in higher education and in the private sector. Bill's first exposure to the idea of accessibility was in grade school. He was paired with special needs students, which provided some brief but impactful glimpses of the struggles. Um, Try not only to survive but thrive in a non-accessible world, and he saw those challenges, you know, firsthand. Bill's recently begun to formally work in accessibility with his appointment as the BTC's electronic IT accessibility specialist. He's, Bill's looking forward to working and learning all he can about accessibility and putting that knowledge to work. He's very passionate about helping the others and has dedicated it, and dedicated his career to doing so. So, thank you to both and. Uh, I will turn off my mic and let you get started. Great. Thank you so much, Mark and Alyssa. Um, so just thank you all for being here and joining us. Happy Global Accessibility Day. Um, like Alyssa said earlier, be sure to check out events in your community. I know there's a ton going on today. I just, before I left my desk, saw that um, UW has a whole slate of different activities and speakers happening, and I just got pinged. Oh, that must have been the timer. Um, so yeah, that was just Mark's timer. I'll set yours. Okay, thank you, Alyssa. Um, yeah, and so we will have a lot of information to cover, but please raise your hand um, or send us a message in the chat box. We are happy to answer questions throughout the presentation. And to get started, we'll just do a quick poll. 
and what are you doing for Global Accessibility Day? So A is watching this webinar, of course. B, my campus is having an awesome event. C, there's a city town event I'm planning on attending. D, I didn't realize it was Accessibility Day. Now I know. Or E, some combination of the above. So we'll give you a few seconds to answer. Yep, go ahead and use the polling tool to mark your responses. And uh, we'll publish those to the whiteboard here in just a second as soon as everybody's had a chance to participate. Still got a few answers coming in. Okay. Okay, looks like we might be good. I'm going to go ahead and publish those for you, Alyssa. There you go. Oh, awesome. Yay! Joining us for the webinar. <laughs> That's great. Um, okay. Yeah, well, let's uh, go forward then. And before we really delve into what our campus has been doing, we wanted to really briefly touch on what policies and laws have um, helped guide, it, guide us and um, formed what we are currently doing. Um, recently, in the last five years or so, there have been many, many cases brought forward by federal agencies um, with accessibility and accommodation issues, um, especially in regards to access to technology. And we, it's a really important part of this conversation, and we can't um, emphasize it enough. But it has a lot of breadth and depth, so we won't go too into it. So don't worry about that. Oh, there we go. So first of all, um, when it comes to electronic and information technology in higher ed or any federal program, really, the importance of Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act can't be um, underscored. It's, it's a huge um, factor. and it was the original um, policy that has started that started the um, accessibility movement other than all of the social justice movements but we'll talk about that um, and that was uh, way back in 1973 and we did just get a revision including uh, a refresh that came out this January that was more specific to assistive technology or information technology and um, that sort of things. Uh, so when it did first come out, it was pretty broad. It was focused on government agencies and ensuring that folks had equal access to government programs. But we realized back in 1990 that that wasn't quite enough. And in 1990 was when the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed. And that was what really started setting the stage for more folks to be able to have equal access to not only um, government programs, but businesses, education, just all, all sorts of things that they deserve and should enjoy as, you know, valuable humans. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so with the Americans with Disabilities Act, we started seeing more folks coming into higher ed um, with different needs. And also around that time, as many of you know, we're starting to get more and more computer technology, and that's where things started clashing. And um, back in March, uh, this last March 2016, our SBCTC board drafted Accessibility Technology Policy 3.20.30b. And that was addressing um, what the Section 508 had in mind about ensuring equal access to information technology. And um, from that, our um, CADO, CADO, however you pronounce that, CADO. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it's CADO. Um, they, it's CADO, OK. It's CADO. Awesome. <laughs> Good job. Um, so, no, thanks. Um, so that, they decided they came together um, to draft policy 188, and um, we'll be talking about how our campus has um, addressed the policy 188 requirements that uh, put a deadline on us and some um, guidelines for really making sure that the um, stuff that we're putting out as a public institution is accessible and gives folks equal opportunity to. Um, 
look towards higher ed. And I think we can go to the next slide. So a short history of the uh, access at Bellingham Tech. Um, with all of those laws in mind, there's another really important component of this is that disability is a form of diversity. And what we have really looked at here at our campus um, is not just the legal, we have to do this side of things, but how do we make our campus more um, accessible, friendly, welcoming, and equitable to anyone that comes through our doors. And it's something that we are trying across campus. There's several different initiatives going on, um, not only for students, but for staff as well. And it's, just not, it's not just about remaining in compliance with the law, right? Access is a fundamental part of campus equity, and our cross-campus collaboration um, is a essential component of that. So, okay. So back in 2013, um, before I was here, there was an accessibility audit on campus, and out of that um, was formed an accessibility team. And that was really a great, um, way to bring folks, stakeholders from across campus together and identify what was missing, what communication lines were getting crossed, and kind of break down those silos that were happening. Um, we have a great leader who's <laughs> uh, been instrumental in um, ensuring that folks from um, instruction from staff, from facilities, all administration, e-learning, all of those voices are represented and to have their um, input heard and also are able to go back to their constituencies and their students and um, make sure that we aren't missing anything. So getting that broad picture together. Um, Sorry, I'm going to pause for just one second. Take a sip of water. Okay. <laughs> so one of the things that we wanted to talk about um, and have a conversation about with you all is who are the accessibility stakeholders on your campus and who should be? Um, one of the things, Bill, do you want to talk about this? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the, for me, this is uh, what I'm hoping will be the biggest takeaway for you guys is uh, for us, I think that our success in collaboration really can be focusing on one thing and that's we identified somebody who was an advocate for accessibility on campus. And I think it's important that everybody do that and that it is somebody who lives, breathes, sleeps accessibility. Somebody who, who has a positive drive and an infectious spirit, I guess, who can, who can drive accessibility. And we have that person, fortunately, in Mary, which you guys probably all know her, but, um, <laughs> you know, that, that, that's my biggest takeaway and that's I what I hope will be your biggest takeaway here is, is just identify somebody who's got passion. And I think that it will kind of, drive itself if, if, if you have that person in place, so. Right. So when um, Policy 188 um, was published, we already had this accessibility team, we had those connections built, and we were able to take um, procedures that we had already been working on at an informal level and turn them into policy that will guide our entire campus. And it was quite, oh, Students, I saw students come up on Alyssa Sells. Thank you. Um, oh, I actually can't was, take credit for that. I was just echoing oh. what the BTC eLearning Lab put in. Um, they said accessibility oh. resources, eLearning, IT, library, dot, 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 students, mm -hmm. and dot, 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 faculty. And I love that the students was capitalized. So I was just oh, good. emphasizing that because I do <laughs> think that students are a great stakeholder. You've got another comment from Marsha, too. She says everyone. 
um, but that um, they need to get a group of people who can do the actual research, get the tools, mm -hmm. train the people, and provide resources and make actually make the things happen. So. Right, and that's a great point. Um, it, it, it's a, it's kind of, it takes a village, but for sure we need those experts and those advocates that are able to reach out. And um, accessibility is never going to be 100% as much as we can strive to make it 100% accessible or equitable. Um, that's an impossibility with everyone as an individual. We all have individual needs, things change constantly, technology changes constantly, and that's something that um, we just continuously work on and being able to bring people into the fold for sure through um, through trainings and research is, is essential for sure. Um, one of the things that we will be doing after these, this webinar is organizing on our campus um, trainings for faculty and staff who are interested in creating accessible documents. So that's a small, um, really manageable step that we can do to spread one form of accessibility as, as wide as possible. And there's a comment, we can be proactive instead of reactive. Yes, yes. absolutely. Yeah. Oh, but about proactive versus reactive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, uh, I think uh, really we're, we're trying to put in place um, a, a process, well, we have put in a process as part of our policy for, uh, that we were heavily involved with uh, our purchasing department, um, our accessibility department, and, and IT and able to put in a, uh, a process that basically everybody's going to be coming through us with software purchases and then we have to be the ones who go through do the testing and in fact we'll get to a, a slide here that, that basically shows this as a visual here. <laughs> Did you have more on? Okay. Um, yeah, we'll actually, that'll be a nice transition okay. into what we're currently doing, so. Okay, so. So our acquisition policy, this is um, what we came up with uh, for accessible technology from Policy 188. Um, I'll go ahead and read the slide for folks. Uh, and basically, uh, B2C provides equal opportunity for all its educational and administrative services, programs, and activities in accordance with state and federal laws. This policy extends to the procurement, development, implementation, and ongoing maintenance of the college's electronic and information technologies. Ensuring equal and effective electronic information technology access is the responsibility of all college administrators, faculty, and staff. So you notice I put some emphasis in there <laughs> myself. That's not actually in the printed policy, but I think it's important to highlight those. And so part of that policy is also B2C shall provide appropriate, effective, and integrated access to technology and electronic content for students, employees, and external community members. This policy applies to the procurement, development, and implementation of instructional administration and communication technology content. And not only does it apply to current and emergent um, technology, um, such as software and hardware, it um, also applies to um, free things that we may use. Mm -hmm. um, it applies to the website, learning management, student information system. There's a whole, it's really broad because again, we're trying to make things as equitable as possible. Um, part of uh, my background has been in universal design and while it doesn't always address um, individual accessibility challenges, uh, part of universal design is that equitable playing field for everyone, especially in terms of education when we look at it through that lens. And there's a comment I'll read, um, once we open the door to accessibility is more than expected of us. Oh, that's a good question. Is that, is that question intended for a, uh, like a faculty perspective, Marcia? Um, yes, sort of. Um, <laughs> really, what would be expected of you, and then that actually kind of leads into our next our next slide here. You, oh, hang on. Alyssa's got something she wants to say here. No, I'll go back to that question. Okay, Marcia. Okay. <clears throat> well, it's, it's kind of addressing that question. I would say 
I don't think it's more that's expected of folks. I think it's just a shift in how we're viewing things. It's a chain. It's a it's a paradigm shift, um, which it, it's funny to use paradigm shift because it seems like some of these changes that we're making are so small, but really it's about these incremental things, like captioning videos or um, presentations or um, using accessible documents or whatever accessible quote unquote um, design feature that you use. Um, those are things that have been in place and available for folks to use. It's just more about making them force of habit. So we're not just using the easy, oh, I want to make all of my head or all of the important things in my document bold. I'm going to actually make sure that it um, has the emphasis tag or something like that. And it, I, in my perspective, at least, it's not adding additional things, it's just kind of changing right. the way we're doing things, if that makes sense. Anyway, that's just a perspective. <laughs> but I'll hand it over. So, so Marcia, your question, from the perspective of is there going to be some expectations of you when we are uh, acquiring software and hardware? Yes, but it's nothing that's, that's going to put you over the top here. So the, the idea is that if, if you have a need for software, um, you would uh, contact a vendor and you would ask them essentially is, is the software accessible and maybe ask for a VPAT if they have one. And, and it, a, a VPAT, it's a voluntary, uh, what is the acronym stand for? Product accessibility yeah. template. It's a voluntary product accessibility template, and essentially, it's uh, the manu or the man not the manufacturer, but the the software developer. They create this VPAT to speak to its accessibility. So, um, so yes, you will be expected, I guess, to to get that initial information, and then once that initial information has been gathered, um, then the uh, you know, based on this flow chart, we're going to analyze it. And if, if they claim to be accessible, then we're going to go ahead and it'll come to us. And then we're going to go verify the accessibility. And we'll add it to a database. And of course, with some notes on, you know, if there's parts of the software that aren't accessible and a bunch of other factors. <laughs> if we determine that the software is accessible at that point, then it would go through the procur procurement. And then we would do some more testing once we received the software, and then we would roll it out. Um, if the product manufacturer claims that the software is not accessible or they don't know, then we can still look at the software. That doesn't mean that, that we can't buy it. What it means is that we have to just we have to go through and, and analyze and determine whether it's accessible or not. Um, and we have a series of tools, uh, you know, a lot of them are free tools available on the web and things for checking accessibility. Um, and some methodologies that we'll be using to, uh, to, to do the testing. And once we determine its accessibility level, um, at that point, we can either, if it's not accessible, we can look at other options. You know, is there another piece of software that's going to do the same thing um, that is accessible? If it's, if there's not, or if it's just, you know, maybe there's other factors that, have, that reason we can't buy that particular software, then we can basically work with AR at that point to establish some potential accommodations so that we can still use the software. And we would, the idea is we would establish those accommodations in advance so if the need ever comes up, we know what we need to do. Right. <laughs> and then, of course, that information would get noted in our database as well. Um, and then we would go ahead and purchase it, and we may, uh, provide our, our waiver for it if it's not fully accessible, and then we would revisit that software at renewal time and whether it's now accessible based on, mm -hmm. you know, more newer versions or whatever from the manufacturer. Right. And uh, I'm going to scroll up. There's a comment here that I wanted to read. Oh, so CIS stands for Computer Information Support Services. Yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, Alyssa commented, if you start creating accessible materials today, you'll be 
able to serve a larger learner audience from this point forward. Accessible content benefits everyone, not just the learners with disclosed disabilities. It's the difference between building stairs versus building a ramp, absolutely, or um, building sidewalks with curb cuts. <laughs> curb cuts are a huge um, thing that some folks don't realize, but if you have a, a wheelchair user or if you have um, someone who maybe is pushing a stroller, they all are going to benefit from that curb cut. And for me, for example, um, I love watching TV with captions. I um, have um, no difficulties with hearing, but for whatever reason, I'm just able to engage with content so much um, more thoroughly if I have captions on the screen. And um, I know for some folks, it's the opposite, where they can't have captions on the screen. So it just, it really depends. And like we're seeing in higher ed, we are getting so many people with um, so many different life experiences and um, ways of processing information. It's great to have these options available for for people. Um, is there another question? Yeah. Oh, uh, Amy from Shoreline was asking about the flowchart and whether she could have it. And of course she can. Oh, yeah. We'll make it available to anybody who's interested. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, ready for our next slide? Okay. Is there, okay, that was the last question. Okay. Perfect. I just want to make sure. So, so does everybody kind of understand this, this flow chart? I assume you do. Um, or are there any questions about it before we move on? Yeah, it looks like not. Okay. So the next part of the presentation, we just wanted to kind of go over some some tools that we've discovered. Um, and it, we're not going to give like any deep demos here or anything, but we just kind of wanted to show some things that we've found and some resources that we've found that might be helpful. Uh, these will all be shared. There's a links page at the end of the uh, presentation, and everybody will be, uh, be able to have access to that to check out all these different uh, checkers here, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and turn on application sharing here and allow you guys to see my screen. So this first tool that we're looking at here, this is it's just a, a website evaluation tool. And essentially, all you do is you paste your uh, your URL of whatever website you want to check into the UR or into this box. Hit enter, and basically, it's going to give you a report that looks like this. And most, a lot of you have probably worked with uh, with some of these checkers for checking websites, or at least your IT departments have, I'm sure. <laughs> but this gives you an idea of the type of, of errors that it found. And um, let's see here, we can go into more information on the types of problems. And um, I think it even gives you a little bit of a, uh, of a description on each one of these, OK? Mm -hmm. So we're not going to go too deep into this, but just, just know it's here, and I would recommend checking it out and check out all of these tools because they're making our lives a lot easier. Right. If we didn't do the BTC website, just in case, <laughs> we've we've used it for our own um, websites. Or for myself, I uh, work with a couple of uh, different groups that have websites, and I've helped them run these um, checkers with them, and then they're able to. Um, if they're not the web developer or the person that's running the website, they're able to work with the person who's able to make those changes. And um, they're pretty, like you just saw, the um, explanations are pretty great and pretty comprehensive. And if you have some basic HTML or, CIS or CSS knowledge, it's, some of it is pretty um, straightforward to make changes. And it even gives you an explanation of, of, of why it matters, which I think is great because it, it explains, you know, the issues that that could cause for somebody who has who has an, an issue with uh, whether it be uh, unable to read based on contrast, you know, the, the, the dark and light levels of a page. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's got all kinds of great information here, so I'd recommend checking that out. Um, the next tool here, I think uh, you were going to Oh, this. yeah. So this is uh, just another um, website evaluator. It, um, it's very similar to WAVE, slightly different um, reporting um, situations. And this is um, through uh, University of Illinois. 
and it's it's great. You don't actually have to have a user account to evaluate, even though it says you do. Um, so you can um, just check this out, compare what the two uh, first wave versus FAE, um, what those reports come up. Because one of the things that um, I, I mentioned before is accessibility is never going to be 100%, but if you only use automated checkers, for sure, accessibility is never going to be 100% because automated checkers can only do so much. They aren't able to necessarily um, navigate or, or, you know, judge the content of a web page the same as a human user would be. So, human testing is just as um, important as using these accessibility checkers. So that's our kind of caveat with that. You know, on that note, if, if you're interested in in experiencing how some of these users experience the world, try unplugging your mouse and navigate your computer without a mouse, and that will give you mm -hmm. kind of their reality, or in some, some of their reality. So it, it's just a good way to really see that it, it's huge. It's, it's not the easiest thing in the world to navigate without a mouse. So <clears throat> um, let's see. This next site here, it's actually a series of tools, and it's a tutorial that I found here recently. And basically, it's a tutorial of, of WCAG 2.0, and there's uh, lots of information here. It's been very helpful to me in understanding some of the principles. Um, so if you're not real familiar with, with, uh, with WCAG 2.0 and that this is one of the standards that we're meeting here, um, then I would recommend checking out this site. Uh, there's also a series of tools here on the same site. Um, everything from website checkers to audio contrast checkers, which would be uh, the uh, the minimum decibel level as opposed to the upper accessible level, which could be a problem for some people who have hearing issues. So, um, anyway, just great tools. I would recommend checking them out. Um, and read through the tutorial because it's got tons of great information and it's completely free. So, and there's a book you can buy as part of it as well. It looks like, but and we're all about the free though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last tool here is a uh, it's a accessibility ribbon for Word. Um, so if you, you're all probably familiar with the, the ribbons at the top of the screen, you know, for like editing Word documents and such, but there's actually a ribbon here that gives you a bunch of accessibility features. And, and yeah, I think you know a little more about this, Alyssa, so let me explain Yeah, so, so basically what this ribbon does, um, I, I've pulled up a kind of a screenshot of what the ribbon looks like. But it creates a new tab in Word um, which brings all of the, um, well, built-in accessibility features in Word onto one nice tab. So for me, it, what's been really helpful is there's this little check accessibility um, button that I don't have to go digging into file options, find accessibility check. I don't have to go through all of that stuff. So once I have a document created, I can press that button and it will run the accessibility checker. Again, it's not going to be perfect. I still want to make sure that I go through and um, ensure that all of that those accessibility features are there, but it's very nice to have it. And it puts all of your styles in one place, um, some of those different um, tools that you'll use for formatting documents so you don't have to do quite as much work to use these tools. And it's, it's completely free. They just did an update that um, came out today for Global Accessibility Day. So if you have the newer versions of Word, that update will be available. And um, again, these links are all going to be on the slide later on. Um, so we'll close I've that. I've also been putting the links in the chat as we go, so everybody has oh, okay. those. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. Wonderful. So there is our slide here. There we go. OK. <laughs> and were there any questions while we have the screen sharing on? Nope. See any other questions in there? I, I made a bunch of comments and um, added the um, links, but um, the audience, I think, was fairly quiet right now. So, okay. Nothing in there that I okay. see particularly. Yep. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, and the wave add-on for Chrome. Yes, so some of these tools. And this is just like a very, very small selection of tools that we just showed. Um, some of the ones that we have listed here, we um, won't show, but we have, um, for example, for Canvas, our fantastic e-learning director has um, installed You Do It as part of a way to check anything that's on our Canvas pages. Um, and so that's something that's been implemented for any Canvas page, any course that's on um, our side of things. And then one of the things that we wanted to talk about here is if there's any resources that you're aware of or that we could benefit from or that or you'd like to share. Yeah, or vice versa. Or uh, vice versa if you have questions about accessibility tools and checkers. Yeah, and don't hesitate to contact me with any questions as well. <clears throat> yep, yep, and Alyssa just commented, yeah, uh, you do it is free and open. Um, and if you are able to work with that accessibility team or your e-learning director and um, get it set up on campus, it's a great way of um, targeting quite a few, well, actually your entire um, online or hybrid courses in terms of improving accessibility there. So it'd be great if everyone took just a second and um, maybe shared a resource. You don't have to necessarily give us the link. If you have it handy, that's great. But if you don't um, have that link, just go ahead and type the name in it. I'm sure we're all resourceful enough to go out and find some of those things. I'm going to put a few uh, in the chat because I knew we were going to be doing this that I thought I would like to share. Um, so the first one is the SBCTC Accessibility 101 training. It's called the Basics of Inclusive Design. And uh, there's a link to the registration page. And um, it's a really great class. I've actually taken it. Jeff Thompson developed it for us. If you would like to um, just take a peek at the class and see what's involved before you register, this next link is to the public version of the class. Uh, you can't submit assignments there, but you can go in and look and see uh, what the class includes. And it's a, um, it's a free class. It's open to everyone in our system. So um, feel free to sign up for that if you're interested. And it looks like um, BTC also added in that they're using the Quality Matters Standard 8. That's also a training that um, my office, um, the Office of uh, E-Learning and Open Education that we pay for. So if you're interested in that, um, that is training that's available. Um, Jared at uh, Spokane Falls Community College says, um, just a retweet in support of you do it. Um, it's easy to work with in Canvas and helps me find all sorts of garbage in my HTML. Yeah, it's a really great tool. And um, like I said, uh, we have a really great programmer here who has made it um, able for all the colleges to host that. So um, go see your campus e-learning office if you're interested in using that, because chances are you already have it. You just don't know it. Um, BTC is also mentioning Ally. Um, that's another accessibility tool that um, we've been piloting at some of the colleges. Um, I'm not sure how many colleges are involved in that, and Jess isn't here. She could probably answer that. But um, yeah, that's another great one. Uh, Angela says, hey, Jared, thanks for attending and letting us know <laughs> what you think if you do it. OK. Um, I also have another one to share. Um, this is not one that I'm super familiar with. I just learned about it yesterday. I was in, um, I can't even remember, I was listening in on another webinar that had to do with accessibility, and they shared this color tool that it, that's new. It looks pretty neat. Um, it's like a contrast checker. I, I didn't play with it very much yet, but um, I looked at it just, just briefly. And it looks like it's pretty neat. You can pick background and foreground or text colors, and it will tell you if it passes. Um, the WCAG, the um, WCAG standards or not. Great. Thank you. Um, Next slide. So yeah, if anyone has any other resources to share, um, we'd love to continue this conversation. Um, I hope you gathered that part of um, this webinar was um, not only sharing resources with you, but also trying to establish that conversation across the state. Um, like we have mentioned a couple times, accessibility is not just a one-man show. It, it takes the whole team. And the more that we are, are sharing these, mm -hmm. the, the better the um, 
possibilities are. And we are not by any means experts. Um, we're still learning, just as all of you are, and I think we all have a long ways to go, but I'm glad that this is happening. And uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. Yeah. Woo! Thank you. Happy Global Accessibility <laughs> Day. Oh, that's it. <laughs> Drop the mic. <laughs> drop and walk away. Uh, it looks like, oh, I saw BTC raise their hand. Um, Don, did you guys have a question? Okay, that was our timer. That was actually our 10-minute um, timer. We still have plenty of time. So um, if there's anything that you want to chat about, ask about, share, now's the time to go ahead and do that. Feel free to raise your hand or type into the chat. Um, maybe you're all off um, investigating all those resources that we just shared with you. Um, so they had a, Bill and Alyssa had a great collection of resources, so I'm sure you're probably um, looking at those already. Um, and Bellingham says, no, they were just clapping. That's fine. So, all right. Well, if there aren't any questions, I'll go ahead and close us out uh, just a little bit early. Um, I'd like to, oh, we've, we've got a question. Mary Pierce, go ahead. Mary, if you're, oh, she says oh. a question. Okay, that was an accidental <laughs> hand raise. Darn it, I got all excited. All right, um, so I would like to invite you all to um, join us again next week for our fifth and final webinar of the IGNIS, 2017 IGNIS webinar series. Um, that'll be Thursday, May 25th, um, same day, um, same time, uh, same day of the week, Thursday, so Thursday from 2 to 3, and we're going to have um, another Bellingham group join us, so woohoo, Bellingham. Um, we've got Marsha Peterson and Anita Pang uh, joining us to talk about engaging students online with web conferencing, so um, I'm sure that's going to be a great one. We had a really great practice session, so I'm looking forward to that. I'd like to thank Bill and Alyssa for joining us today, and um, giving us a lowdown and um, getting us going for our Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Here is um, my contact information and Mark's contact information. Uh, should you need to ask us a question, we're easy to find. I'm acells at sbctc.edu, and Mark is mcarbon at sbctc.edu. If you need um, any resources um, from the webinar or need to get in contact with um, the presenters, uh, just shoot us an email and we'll get you whatever you need. Remember, the recording will be posted to the ATL blog, and I gave you that link earlier. Thank you so much for joining us, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.